Welcome to the Creative Pen Podcast. I'm Joanna Penn, thriller author and creative entrepreneur, bringing you interviews, inspiration and information on writing, publishing options and marketing ideas for your book. You can find the episode show notes, your free author blueprint and lots more information at thecreativepen.com and that's pen with a double N. And here's the show. Hello creatives, I'm Joanna Penn and this is episode 555 of the podcast and it is Friday the 4th of June 2021 as I record this. In today's show I'm talking to Guy Windsor, the sword guy, about how to teach physical skills with books and more than that, how to take a business that used to be based on in-person teaching and physical events to a virtual business. And luckily, Guy started switching over before the pandemic and was well placed to have a very good year financially because of the multiple streams of income he had built up. Whereas if he had only been dependent on those in-person classes, it would have been very difficult. So it's a fascinating interview. And Guy gave me some ideas. Now you think I have multiple streams of income. Guy is doing a lot more. (laughs) So I know you will find it useful and interesting, whatever you write. So that's coming up in the interview section. In publishing news or useful things for authors, Christine Catherine Rush has a useful series at her blog Chris Writes at the moment on fear-based decision making and how it's impacting authors, the publishing industry and TV and film rights at the moment. So we have all been living in fear mode during the pandemic and of course it is still ongoing (laughs) Uh, and it's uh, who knows when it will be over but uh, we all need to lever ourselves back into making decisions in other ways especially about our writing and publishing careers. So Chris's latest post goes into how the traditional publishing business model really needs to change as physical book sales have moved online and consumer behaviour during the pandemic will continue not return to how it used to be. She says that actually complaining that backlist now makes up roughly two thirds of book sales instead of monetizing that backlist as the TV companies have finally learned to do. And of course, we saw this week Amazon bought MGM, which includes a catalogue of 17,000 TV shows and 4,000 films, including James Bond, uh, one of my favourites. And uh, the article, uh, the press release from Amazon, quotes an Amazon executive as saying, the real financial value behind this deal is the treasure trove of IP, intellectual property, in the deep catalogue that we plan to reimagine and develop together with MGM's talented team. It's very exciting and provides so many opportunities for high quality storytelling. So if you have ever had any doubts about the valuable of IP, intellectual property, which is what we create when we write books. <laughs> I hope this shows you. Obviously, uh, none of us individually are going to come up with 17,000 uh, books. I think um, Isaac Asimov has written, well, has written, <laughs> did write in his lifetime about 400 books. I think Enid Blyton was at 500. Uh, I think R.L. Stein, who is still alive, is, I think he's on about 500. So... <laughs> Um, I don't know what Nora Roberts is on, actually. She is very prolific. uh, So who knows? But anyway, developing intellectual property is where the money is for the long term and in the backlist. And what's so interesting is this has always been the indie author model. And in fact, the early indie authors, uh, often they were romance writers or genre fiction writers who um, got into indie early. The most successful ones, people like Bella Andre, um, Barbara Freethy, um, J.A. Conrath, Joe Conrath, they already had sort of 30 plus books from traditional publishing. And in fact, Patricia McLean talked about this sort of 28 books she'd written for traditional publishing. Coming in with a backlist is is a, a big deal when you go indie. And in fact, if you're listening and you're traditionally published and you can get your rights back, it's a really good way to immediately start making money is having a backlist that you can effectively monetize. Now, I think indies, a lot of new authors in general and indies coming, new indies coming in think that the launch is a big deal. But I certainly don't think the launch is a big deal. And if you're a more relaxed author, as I'll be uh, discussing with Mark Lefebvre in our book, which is on pre-order, one of the great things about the indie model is this relaxed idea that the backlist is where the income is. And 
it's about monthly sustainable income for the long term rather than this sort of spike income that then there's nothing else for months or potentially years. So all of our focus is on creating books for that backlist. And if you don't know what that is, backlist is essentially any book that is not your latest book, (laughs) Uh, which means you have this, as they mentioned, the Amazon executive mentioned, deep catalogue. And I know it's difficult if you're just starting out, um, but believe me, it does. It gets easier. (laughs) It gets easier to make recurring income when you have this deep catalogue. And it just takes time. I mean, it takes time and effort, obviously, over the long term. But hey, what else do you want to be doing? (laughs) Talking about money, Dean Wesley Smith has a great article on money under his Deadly Problems for Writers, which I think will be a new series. Now, Dean Wesley Smith is Christine Catherine Rush's husband and business partner at WMG Publishing. And between them, they are... I don't know what they have, probably 80, 90 years worth of publishing experience between them. And... um, Uh, Dean says, over the last month or so, the biggest and most deadly issue I've tried to help writers through is the desire to make a lot of money with book sales quickly. (laughs) In other words, the writer is not focused on the fun of writing a story, but on how the book is selling after they have finished it. This is what I call product focused rather than process focused. Dean lists a number of the ways that writers can slip into this product-focused thinking, including comparing your sales to other writers. And I must say, this is very hard to avoid. I struggle with comparisonitis. I think we all do, such is life. Um, But we keep fighting. I think identifying it is important. So you can say, ah, I see I'm suffering from comparisonitis. I think I'm going to just put it over here and get on with my writing. Uh, What else does he say? Writing to a sales deadline if you've put up (laughs) pre-orders, for example and uh, focusing on only one way to sell a book. Um, Yeah, so essentially slipping into that business head when you should be in your creative head. Dean says, the goal is to sit alone in a room and make stuff up. Anything your creative voice wants to make up without any influence from what the book will be at the end. Then when you're finished, give the product some time and do as best as you can with it. Promise yourself that when the book is done, you will do the best you can on the product part. But until the book is done, only think about the process of writing and having fun. You will find yourself creating some amazing stuff, original stuff. And wow, will you have fun doing it. And uh, yeah, I love Dean and Chris. They are two of my most important mentors. And by that, I mean, I buy their books and courses, read their blogs and attend their physical workshops when I can. And uh, as I said, they've been they've been successful full time authors for over 40 years each, pivoting, learning from the changes. And, you know, they went indie a few years back and still have hybrid deals and things. But we all need to listen to people who have been successful for the long term. And that's why I always like to, to share this information. The other interesting news I saw this week is that The Guardian reports that authors will be able to earn royalties on secondhand print books for the first time. This made the news, but when you actually read the details, this is only for when books are bought online from two specific secondhand bookstores here in the UK. (laughs) And while I think authors will appreciate the gesture, I don't expect it will result in more money, even if more bookstores sign up. And of course, it will benefit the authors who already sell a lot in print. So it's going to be, you know, there's always, if you go into a secondhand book, bookstore there's always 18 copies of of Dan Brown (laughs) Da Vinci Code and you know whatever copies of the latest one they put in all the supermarkets Um, but to me the game changer for the secondhand market will be blockchain smart contracts which will automate downstream revenue for authors and in fact I wanted to mention it because I have an in-between episode coming up this week on NFTs for authors which I'll be discussing this secondhand digital market in more detail so yeah I just wanted to mention that. In terms of my personal update, yes, I'm back from my cycling holiday in the Cotswolds. Oh, we were so lucky with the weather because the week before it was hailing, it was freezing and Jonathan and I were like, oh my goodness, it's going to be so miserable. But the weather was gorgeous and it was lovely to be out of the house. We were in the fresh air all day and we didn't see a lot of people, to be honest. Um, You could actually forget there was a pandemic (laughs) because we would, you know, we were obviously in the hotel and in the accommodation, the B&Bs at night, we would wear our mask in um, communal areas but basically once we got on our bikes out in the um, Cotswolds we were cycling and then if we stopped at a shop or whatever then sure you wore your mask to go in but basically it was very good 
break. And I've done cycling trips before down the southwest coast of India and also through the islands off of Croatia. But it's been a few years. And to be honest, I generally focus on walking. (laughs) So I am not cycle fit. And it was physically challenging in many ways, but it was so necessary to get out the house. I'm sure you feel that. And it's just not possible to travel very far. There's still a lot of restrictions here in the UK. And the Cotswolds is literally our backyard. I can see the southern end of the Cotswolds from my window, from my bedroom window. So, uh, but we went, we basically cycled Oxford to Bath and on Books and Travel, you can see all my pictures. So you just go to booksandtravel.page forward slash blog and you'll find it or you can uh, go to the show notes links in the show notes as ever and talking of getting out the house I did a very strange thing this week (laughs) I couldn't really believe it myself but basically I have done my uh, before the pandemic I would go to a local cafe and write it would open at seven I'd be there I'd be one of them I'd often be there before they even open the door and I would write sort of seven till 9 30 and then a lot of the mums and kids and you know people would come in and it was too busy you couldn't take up a table but because of the pandemic even though the cafes have started to open up they're not opening early because there's no commuters not enough commuters to make it worth them opening early so I was like what am I going to do I really want to get out the house so I have joined a co-working space which is really hilarious as I you know I am an introvert but again I'm just treating it exactly as I would my cafe which is I go in early put my headphones on and do my writing and So I'm really glad and hopeful that I can get back into a better routine. I do find that this year, this more than a year now, has made my, I guess my writing and my business and everything overlap way too much. And in fact, what Dean said resonated with me so much because I feel like I have been struggling fiction wise for sure, because I'm so inspired by my travels and I need a different place, physical place to do my fiction creating. So I feel very happy. I spent a couple of happy hours at the co-working space working on what I was calling Day of the Martyr. And, And this is, as I discussed with Patricia McLean the other day on the Discovery Writing episode, when you're a discovery writer and you try to come up with something way in advance what then happens is you start writing and it doesn't turn out that way so day of the martyr i i even got a cover designed and everything and i was going to put it up for pre-order thank goodness i didn't (laughs) because i now think it's going to be called something else and it's based on the historical murder of thomas beckett but it's really turned into something quite different. And uh, in fact, if you go onto my Instagram at JF Penn Author, I just shared my book stack <laughs> of research books and it's turning into something. Yeah, I don't even know what it is at the moment. That's the fun of discovery writing. But I am going to London this Sunday to the British Museum, first time again in 18 months, to the Thomas Beckett exhibition. I'm so excited very looking forward to getting ideas from a new thing so essentially you can hear I'm just it's so good to be getting out of the house and I really fingers crossed we don't get locked down again which uh, (laughs) really really don't want that to happen so yes I feel like I'm coming into I needed the break um, but also I'm ready to get back into work I have parked the shadow book again it feels it just doesn't feel right to me right now and yeah I did about I've got about 30,000 words on it and I'm parking it for now as I said it's going to be it's going to take a while that book I don't know what it's turning into but you know you've got to let the muse do the muse thing and uh, but I feel good to be writing some fiction for sure. So thanks for your emails and tweets and comments. SJ says, uh, thank you so much for mentioning that search hack of yours by putting all your books into one Scrivener document. I think I said it was Vellum, but it's the same thing with Scrivener. Here I am writing a spin-off series. I'm constantly reopening books from the original series and searching. It's such a pain. Today I started a master Scrivener file, put all my books in. This is such a handy tip and will save me loads of time. Because I will never not be a discovery writer, I might as well make the technology work for me and um, thanks Steph I'm glad you found that useful and yeah if these are little hacks I think by sharing them we can all figure out ways to work 
Rene said, I love Patricia's buffet advice and I can hardly wait to read Survival Kit. I'm also thrilled to find a writing pro who uses Word instead of Scrivener. I've tried Scrivener three times and I still detest it. <laughs> to each their own. Uh, yeah, no, that's fantastic. Oh, and Rene says, my favourite podcast in a long time. Great. This one definitely resonated with all you discovery writers out there. Umu on YouTube said, I love the interview with Patricia. I resonated with the process. I listened a few times already since it came out. I'm planning a few more lessons while I write. This seriously cured my writer's block depression. Oh, I'm so glad. Um, and Jean said, the not very well-known six-figure author. What a dream. <laughs> I found myself so drawn to the conversation, nodding my head in agreement many times. I'm so glad, everyone, you all found that useful. And Mary said, thanks for the episode on editing. I found it really encouraging. Just last week, I signed a contract for my first novel, currently preparing to send in my manuscript for a developmental edit. The whole process feels a bit overwhelming. Natasha's advice to allow yourself a few days to absorb an editor's comments was a great reminder. Really appreciated this. Well, thank you, everyone. And of course, you can always leave a comment on the uh, on the blog at thecreativepen.com forward slash podcast and find the episode or if you go to the blog in the week it comes out, it will be there. You can email me, Joanna, at The Creative Pen. You can tweet me at The Creative Pen. And you can also leave a comment on YouTube if you listen on uh, on YouTube, which is fantastic. OK, so today's show is sponsored by Kobo Writing Life. And I wanted to mention that I still publish direct to KWL, have done since I think like 2012 or something uh, with my ebooks and some audiobooks. I love their promotional tab. In fact, I did this yesterday as I as I wrote this out, ready to uh, read it today. Uh, I can submit my books to promotions every month. And it is definitely one of the tips to sell more books on Kobo is you must uh, get onto that promotional tab. You just need to ask for access. Access. Also, my best selling books on Kobo are fiction box sets because they are easy to merchandise and put into those promotions. So if you write fiction and you don't have box sets of three books or more, then definitely put that on your to-do list. So I'll play a word from Tara and Steph in a minute. You can also listen to episode 539 with Tara on more tips to sell more books on Kobo Writing Life. So this type of corporate sponsorship pays for the hosting, transcription and editing. But my time in creating the show is sponsored by my patrons and especially the limited series of AI and futurist episodes. More coming soon, which I'll talk about after the interview um, in terms of what's coming. These are all sponsored by my patrons because I don't have any uh, other sponsorship on that. Thanks to new and returning patrons in the last few weeks. And of course, to all of you who've been supporting the show for months and years, you're all amazing. Thanks to Shia LaRoe Winter, Valerie Miller, Earl Sires, Nicholas Lemieux, H.L. Brooks, M.H. Witten, Eric M. Hill and Steve Kurtz. And again, thank you to everyone. It makes such a difference to me knowing that you still find the show useful after all these years. <laughs> so if you want to support the show for just a couple of dollars or euros or pounds or Canadian dollars a month or a couple of coffees a month if you're feeling generous and you'll get the extra monthly Q&A audio which I record around the mid-month and uh, you get to ask your questions and you get a sort of behind the scenes thing going on, you can support the show at patreon.com, P-A-T-R-E-O-N dot com forward slash the creative pen right here's a word from kobo writing life and then we'll get into the interview hi i'm stephanie and i'm joni and we're from kobo writing life kobo's free fast and easy self-publishing platform kwl was built by authors for authors and our team of dedicated book lovers are always working hard to help authors reach new readers around the world with that in mind, we want to tell you about Kobo's subscription reading service, Kobo Plus. This program has been a great success in the Netherlands and Belgium, which is why we decided to bring it to our home market and launch Kobo Plus in Canada. The great thing about Kobo Plus for authors is that it reaches an entirely new audience who may be trying digital reading for the first time. We also ensured that authors retain control of their books. Do you want to try out a book in Kobo Plus in Canada, but not in the Netherlands? You have the option to do that. Simply select the areas you want to be included in the rights and distribution section of your book. 
My favorite feature for authors is that there's no exclusivity with Kobo Plus. You can sell your books wherever you choose, and we encourage you to make your work available to as many readers as possible. It's a great way to gain and build an audience. If you want to learn more about Kobo Plus or Kobo Writing Life, check out our blog, podcast, and find us on social. You can create your free account at kobo.com slash writing life. Back to you, Joanna. Guy Windsor is a consulting swordsman, teacher, and author specializing in medieval and Renaissance Italian swordsmanship. He runs Sword School and is the host of the Sword Guy podcast. Welcome back to the show, Guy. Nice to see you, Joanna. Thanks for having me. Oh, no, it's great to have you back. Now, just for everyone listening, you were on the show back in episode 229 when we talked about sword fighting and writing and martial arts. So I'm sorry, everyone, we're not talking about how to do sword fighting today. But no. just tell us a bit more about what you do, because it is pretty cool. And people in their heads, they might picture you standing there in some sort of Renaissance uh, Italian clothing with your sword out. <laughs> Well, <laughs> that's not such a bad picture to have. But uh, yeah, basically what I do is I find uh, historical sources which basically explain how sword fighting works in that particular period from that particular master's point of view. And when necessary, transcribe them and translate them and figure out how to train the actions that they represent. And so that gives me a whole bunch of, should we say, historical sword fighting techniques, which I then organize into a syllabus so that my students can learn it the way you learn any other skill. So I teach historical martial arts because it's historical. In other words, it comes from historical research and it's martial arts because it's it's not just sword fighting. It's also, you know, wrestling and kicking and throwing people on the floor and that kind of stuff. All good, healthy fun. Indeed. But, but you do actually have swords and you can actually fight with them. Oh, hell yes. I mean, swords, swords are the main thing that, you know, they're for my people, like the sword people, the sword is is the shiny hook that brings them into the art. And it's this kind of totemic object that is imbued with all sorts of cultural and spiritual and practical meanings. And yeah, I mean, you can tell sometimes we do events at, at fairs or whatever and some people walking by they see a table full of swords their eyes go wide they are magnetically attracted to them and when they pick one up you can see just this this switch go on in their head and when that happens you know they're one of us right and and for most of most of the human population that's doesn't happen that's fine they have other things some people i'm told like football i don't understand why but <laughs> It's, it's not up to me to understand. It's the sword people are my people. And so I've always been into martial arts, but the sword is the special thing. It's like the, the I don't know. It, yeah. I, I, th- I like it, the shiny it, hook. The shiny hook yeah. for the niche is, is great. And I think this is a really good place to start. And we're going to be talking a lot about your business model today. But this idea of being clear on your niche is, yeah. is so important. And I feel like a lot of people get it wrong. But what you said there is, you know, if people pick up a sword and their si- eyes light up or they find you online with some kind of sword keywords, then you know right. you've got them, right? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, for example, one woman in her 60s living in America uh, found through some, she was looking up sword fighting in books or something like that. And she came across my sword fighting for writers, game designers and martial artists book, which has a forward by Neil Stevenson, who is her favorite author. And she was like, Oh my God, got to get that. And from that, she found out that you can actually train swords for real, actually really, 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 can you really do that? Oh my God. And she's a woman in her sixties. So of course she you know, contacts me and you know, starts doing the solo training stuff at home that you can do in a pandemic. And it was latent within her her whole life. She just didn't know it was possible. So yeah, it's just. I love that. Yeah, absolutely. And and it's not for everyone, but that's okay. It's not like non-sword people are you know 
Well, you're not 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 really a sort of person. No, I'm, I'm not. But I, I'm confident. kind of. I, I think probably a lot of people listening who write books that are interested mm. in writing fight scenes or sword scenes. That's what we we talked about last time. But let mm-hmm. let's get into your business because okay. this is re- why we're talking really today. Is that obviously we're still in a pandemic, and you have a what is essentially a physical skill doing stuff yeah. with swords, physical objects, yeah. physical skill, physical martial arts. So yeah. we're going to talk about your business model but just you mentioned one of your books there but just outline Mm. what are the various streams of income that you have as part of your business what are your multiple streams of income okay this this is kind of attached to the the other question because it goes to sort of business structure in the beginning i showed up and i taught classes in person i rented a space and people came and sometimes i traveled and i taught classes in person and that was my only income and then my first book came out in 2004, didn't, I mean, it sold okay, but because of various shenanigans, it didn't make me any money, but it made me reputation and I got to travel a bit, but still, and then when my second book came out in 2006, again, it was a great reputation builder, but didn't actually make any money. Then in 2007, I bought a space and rented it out to my students so that there was like a an additional stream of income there. I'm still teaching regularly, four nights a week, weekends, traveling, that kind of stuff. So in 2007, 2008, I had like income from showing up and teaching and income from renting out the space. And of course, both of those disappeared in 2020, right? My students renting my sal in Helsinki, you know, I contacted them and said, look, you guys are closed. You can't possibly pay rent until you're open again. And so we dropped the rent down to just cover the running costs of the building. So both those streams of income effectively disappeared in 2020. But by that point, by 2012, 2013, I was self-publishing my books and making actual income from it, which was like literally the moment I started self-publishing as opposed to going through publishers. Um, they actually started like making money. The turning point, I guess, was December 2015, where you know it had been like a trickle of income, like steady, but not nothing like major. But like the December 2015, I looked at my report from Lightning Source because this is the, like, the paperbacks and hardbacks I'd published through Lightning Source because Ingram Spark didn't even exist yet. And I looked at it and I realized that just the income from the sales of paperbacks and hardbacks that month was actually enough to cover all costs, you know, income and expenses. And, you know, I have a wife and children and mortgage and all that sort of stuff. All of that was covered by that one payment. It was like, oh my God, I need to take this really seriously. <laughs> right. Which is of course, when I got into your stuff, because I started looking at, into how to take the self-publishing thing more seriously. And so I came across your podcast and, I've got your book, How to Market a Book, which really, really helped me take this book marketing thing more seriously. And then in 2016, I decided, again, having listened to one of your podcast episodes, I started creating online courses, which, again, even um, putting them together wasn't very difficult. Selling them was harder because I had to, you know, I, I figured out, after the first one launched and it made a bit of money on launch and then nothing. And then when I launched the second one, I was like, I've got to do this properly. And so I, again, did some research and I actually did a proper like six email launch sequence thing with a time limited discount and everything. And it was absolutely staggering the difference it made. So I have these online courses, which I'm now launching properly (laughs) and I'm producing books uh, self published them, of course. So, since basically since 2016, I haven't been dependent on showing up and teaching in person because we moved to the UK in 2016. And I knew that to do that, I, I would have to kind of become independent of that regu- the income you get from showing up in person. And I still teach in seminars in, in Australia and America and places. Um, And that was a significant income stream, but it wasn't a vital one. And, you know, I'm hoping that that will come back as basically as soon as I can get back on a plane, I am 
back to America and back to Australia and back to Germany and back to Finland and you know, all these places where I have branches. But thanks to the online courses and the books, I'm not actually dependent on showing up on any given day, which mm. is just, just a massive, massive um, sort of change. But most recently, uh, I've, you know, I also have a card game, which came out like six years ago. But I started a Patreon recently, which is, it's, I'm not really pushing it. I'm just interested to see how it works as a model. And I do, I have some students who I mentor one-on-one, which is actually me showing up in person and, you know, them having like an hour of my time while we talk about their publishing or their book they're working on or their online courses or whatever. Um, And so not regular income, but I intermittently crowdfund certain projects which kind of helps with all sorts of things. Like, well, for example, I've actually got a, a blog post about this, which goes into the nitty gritty down to the very last cent of how much money you make per book, crowdfunding it rather than publishing it normally. And mm. basically people are willing to spend a lot more money on a crowdfunding campaign than they are in a bookshop. Um, yes. There's... Well, we might, we might come back, come back to that. Cause sure. um, yeah, you've got, <laughs> Do <laughs> you've got a lot of different I have a lot of stuff going on yes yeah <laughs> well you know I learned from the best <laughs> <laughs> well it's funny because I feel like uh I have done a lot of things and then over t- mm. in the last few years I've been cutting them out so we're going to come back right. to managing your time but I did want to ask about books and workbooks sure. which again you teach a physical skill so yeah. what are the challenge and a lot of people listening I know we've we've had Joseph who does guitar books but mm-hmm. again that's kind of reading music uh, so how are you using books and workbooks to teach a physical skill and any tips for people because I imagine you have to incorporate incorporate a lot of images yeah well most of my books so far have used a lot of images but uh when I started the whole workbook idea it I thought about what I would actually want if I was learning martial arts from a book and the thing is martial arts are all about movement and Yes, you can get a long way with books. And of course, the martial arts I teach are based on my research into books. We have no video from the Middle Ages, unfortunately. But the getting the movement into the student's head via the page is super hard. Mm. And you obviously, you can't embed a video in a printed book. But then I came to the realization that absolutely everyone, almost everyone, I have some Um, very Luddite students too, but almost everyone has a smartphone in their pocket that will play video easily, right? So what I did was instead of having, for this series of rapier workbooks, and I have a series of uh, longsword workbooks coming out soon, instead of having images of like, this is the beginning, this is the middle, this is the end, I would have the same kind of textual description and perhaps a picture, but... I shot video of the action and then posted that clip online on my Vimeo account, linked to it through a pretty link. So a link redirect that goes through my website. So if I need to change the video, I don't have to change the printed link and then have a QR code of that link printed on the page so that once you've read through the exercise, you take out your phone, point it at the page, it takes you straight to the video And of course, I can track that link. So I know that people are doing it, uh, which helps. And that way, it's it's the closest we can get to actually embedding video onto a physical page. Because of course, for workbooks, what I really wanted was something that could lay flat and that students could write on with a decent pen. I'm a fountain pen nerd. And (laughs) the, the, the notion of having paper that you just, you write on it and the ink leaks through to the other side, that's just that, no, we can't be doing that. So I did an awful lot of fiddling about finding various printers. And I'm very much in favor of passive income. I don't ever want to have to pack and ship a book. There are exceptions, but generally speaking, I I don't want to be dependent at any point on that. So, but I found that you can't really get that quality of paper and that quality of printing in a lay flat format that, is you know printed through for example ingram they don't do them 
No, I mean, lay, lay flat you, is very, very yeah. difficult in general. Yeah. So, so yeah. Where, where did you do that? Well, what I did was I, I bit the bullet and I did a print run at bookprinting.co.uk, mm -hmm. which, were, which was fine quality. And then I have a colleague who is in the business of packing and shipping books, and I got him to stock those books for me. And I sold the PDFs that you can print at home. So you can print them and, and have them comb bound or spiral bound at home. And then uh, my assistant actually found a company in the States called Vivanti that they're not really set up for, for it in, in the way that you'd think. Like when you sell books through them, they will print them and distribute them pretty much the same way Ingram does. But if you want to get paid, you have to email them in the first week of the month <laughs> and, and tell them that you'd like to get paid and how much of the money in your account you would like, and then they'll send it to you. So it's not really set up for what I wanted to do. But they're there. You, you can, they, they will actually do um, sort of print on demand, spiral bound, reasonable paper quality. But actually, it's actually it brought up a really interesting lesson. I really care about paper quality. Right. I really care about my, you know, my lovely antique uh, Parker vacuumatic and the inks that I'm using. And, you know, it's a, it's, there's a tactile sensation to writing with a really good pen. And, you know, I can geek out about that for ages. But the thing is, the books aren't actually for me. Right. I don't yeah, need a absolutely. basic. I don't need a beginner's guide to rapier. I wrote the beginner's guide to rapier. So it occurred to me that. It really, most people don't actually care that much. And so I was letting my perfect be the enemy of their good. Mm. And so I, I still have Vivanti going, so you can still get the spiral bound ones. I've stopped printing at book printing and I've put them through Ingram so that you know they come out perfect bound so like an ordinary paperback but they're like a4 size so they're quite big and you can kind of open them almost flat and there's also there's nothing crack the spine a bit they do i mean yeah. that, that's how yeah. i do mine as well i just do them right. at ingram yeah and there's nothing stopping you you know like taking them to a, a, a local book printers who will comb bind them for you you can do that too you can just cut the spine off and, and comb bind them but also and literally just this week I've bitten another bullet and also I'm producing those as ebooks, which is not my idea of a workbook, but some people want their workbooks on their Kindle and that's, they should be allowed that. They should have that. Oh, I need to do that. I'm, I'm glad you said that because I've had that on my list for ages. And every time I look at it, I go, well, why would anyone do that? And you, right, you, you're like do. the third person <laughs> who's mentioned this, yeah. which is kind of crazy. And also the other thing is like my husband has a stylus on a on mm. an iPad. So you can actually now write on yeah. these things mm. anyway. So, yeah, I want to come back on a couple of things. You sure. said you use the QR code. So for people yeah. listening who might not understand, you you hold up your phone's camera and it points at the QR code, which is like a little a square shape. But I think we've been using this a lot more in the pandemic, like uh, restaurants mm -hmm. and things have been doing this. Right. But but my question for you is, so how did you create the QR codes? What, what app did oh. you use or site or whatever? Ah, there's there's a million sites online that will do it for free. What you do is you paste the link into a field and it generates a QR code and you just download it as a JPEG or TIFF file. You don't or whatever. have a recommended site you use. Cause I know I there are so many, I just, a lot of them do a lot of ads and stuff. I honestly, I don't remember. Okay. So you, just, <laughs> you just used a, a basic I just use some, yeah. Cause again, I'm only producing, um, you know, maybe it, in my four rapier workbooks, there's probably about a hundred or so of them. And honestly, what I did is I emailed a, a list of links to my VA and asked her to produce the QR codes, please. Because <laughs> she's very good at that kind of thing. 
Yeah, no, that that's fantastic. And I love that you did those little um, videos as well. And I think we can now incorporate QR codes a lot more. I've been very reticent about it. And I've used, as you mentioned, pretty links. I use pretty mm-hmm. links to just create something easy, but they still have to then type it in right. from print. So QR codes are perfect. And I this is something I want to do as well in the future. Now, can we just talk about your other uh, and you briefly mentioned that you're doing the online courses and you obviously you're incorporating videos there any particular lessons learned from creating videos that might help people okay my view is I'm, I'm not a videographer right and I'm not teaching videography so the videography doesn't actually matter so much what matters is a clear picture and clear explanation. So the information that they're looking for needs to be clear, right? So the sound quality needs to be quite good. So what I do for sound quality is I have a lavalier mic, which I plug into my phone and I record it like you would record dictation. And then I take that locally recorded audio and I stitch it onto the, um, onto the video file. And so I get a clearer, because the, the, the noises that really matter are, the speech that you are making, you know, the, the, the verbal instruction. And of course, the mic will also pick up the clang of steel, which is quite important to our sword people. So oh, lovely. Sound yeah, 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 yeah. But the sound quality needs to be good enough. It doesn't have to be perfect. The video quality needs to be good enough. It doesn't have to be perfect. Unless you're teaching videography or you know, if you're teaching like audio engineering, your sound quality must be immaculate. But if you're teaching swordsmanship, then they're not expecting me to do amazing visuals and amazing audio stuff. It can just be teaching a class. Like, like I would teach a class, you know, I I just imagined that I had my regular class with me and I had my training partner there and whoever was behind the camera, if we even had somebody behind the camera would be like the audience or the, the, the members of the class. And I would just demonstrate the way I demonstrate and explain the way I explain. And it worked just fine. There's all sorts of things you can do to make it harder for yourself. Like my first few courses, I organized transcription of all the videos and I didn't get round to it for like number three or four and not a single person complained or asked for it. So I thought, what well, if, if one of the students like emails me and says, well, guy on, on the dagger course, you've got these transcriptions, which I find really helpful, but they're not there on the rapier course would you provide them? Then I would, yeah, I would, now that I've got my business working better and there's a lot more money coming through, I would just, you know, fire off a few emails and get somebody to do it and it would be done. But, you know, there's no need to, it doesn't have to be this big bells and whistles, perfect production straight out of the gate. Yeah, that's another really good point. And it's funny because it mirrors your book situation, your workbooks, in that you went hard with the over quality. Exactly. And then you've taken a step back as you realise that that's just not necessary. And in fact, the first course I built back in 2008, 2009, Mm -hmm. which was my original Author 2.0 course, was the biggest course I ever made. And it (laughs) sold the fewest number of right. copies it was the right. mega mega course and now i'll do a course for like 49 dollars that's just mm-hmm. a couple of hours and that will do better than the original mega one right. so that's a great lesson learned too uh, i also want to ask you about this card game so i oh, sure Yeah. So I looked at your card game it looks amazing it fits really well with the sword kind of idea but I imagine that the audience is not actually the same. So tell us about the card game. Why create one? And okay. uh, how did that happen? And, and any lessons on that? Oh, sure. Okay. I have a fundamental principle, which I follow whenever I'm making any of these sorts of decisions. And that is, does this serve the art? My job is to serve the art of arms and the people who care about the art of arms. Right. So, I don't do complicated business analysis of if it's going to make my, I don't actually care. So long as I have enough money coming in to pay for the things I want to do, if it serves the art, I will get it done. And what happened was we've been, we've had a rapier class and one of my students, a guy called Rami Larksonen, and I were chatting after class about how difficult it is for many people to remember the Italian terms for the techniques and actions that we do. And 
yeah, at the same time, they have no problem knowing the names of like 500 different footballers or 2 million <laughs> Pokemon cards. I think whatever, you have a chip right? about football. No, no, no. no. <laughs> Me too. Um, then, <laughs> right. Yeah, I was forced to play it at school a bit. And it, you know, why would anybody want to run around after a bag? I do not know. Anyway, so then we thought, well, hang on. Why don't we have like, why don't we have like flashcards with the names of these techniques and things on that we can, you know, do? And I thought, well, you know, in in the army or in the armed forces generally in the Second World War, in the British armed forces, they had playing cards with the silhouettes of ships on them so that people could recognize German or Japanese or American or British ships. Likewise with aircraft. And these days in uh, Afghanistan and in Iraq, American and British soldiers have packs of cards with sort of the top 52 most wanted um, Taliban people that they're after, right? So they'll recognize the face because, oh, that bloke over there, he looks just like the Nine of Diamonds. (laughs) <laughs> yeah. right right it works so then we thought well why don't we make like a poker deck with like sword stuff on and then we can like play cards and you'll kind of pick up that then rami was like why don't we make a card game that actually like is a sword fight right and this another student walking past went i'd buy that so we thought huh okay and it occurred to me that this hits several interesting kind of instructional points. So firstly, different people learn differently, right? Some people learn great from video. Some people learn great from books. Some people really need to see things in person. And this is just another way of getting the information that my students want to learn conveniently into their heads. Okay. So it serves the art. It's a great idea. Secondly, it's also an opportunity to, analyze how uh, Fiore's longsword material, which Fiore Delivery was a 15th century, pardon, 14th century Italian um, combat master who wrote a fantastic book called Il Fiore Battaglia, The Flower of Battle. And in it, you know, I, I have sort of absorbed the technical and tactical content of that book for the last 25 years. And so what this card game does is it reproduces the actual process of a sword fight as it is represented by Fiore in his book. Okay. So all the terminology comes from the book and there are specific plays like named actions, like for example, the breaking of the thrust, which can occur in gameplay. Right. And most critically, every, every legal game, in other words, every game that follows the rules can be reproduced sword in hand without any logic problems. Right. So you never end (laughs) <laughs> yeah it's super hard and of course i don't know anything about game design and i can't draw either so rami and i were like hmm well if we're going to do this we're going to need a game designer and we're going to need an artist so we're going to need money and rami was studying at a the Hager hellier school of business which is a, a business school in, in helsinki and they have grants for this sort of business development thing so he went and successfully applied for a five thousand euro grant which we then had the money to hire um, a game designer and a an artist to do well the game design we got the the main structure of the game clearly in place and so like fundamentally it was playable you could you could print out the cards on you know ordinary paper and no pictures or anything but you could actually play the game okay mm-hmm. and we got an got the artist to do I think four or five like sample cards and that's how much money we had. And then we took the working game and the sample art to Indiegogo. And I thought it was my, I think it was my fourth crowdfunding campaign. So I had some experience in crowdfunding already and we, we needed to finance the game and the, the best way to finance it was obviously to get people to buy it. So we launched this, crowdfunding campaign and it did really well we raised about fifty-seven thousand euros i think mm-hmm. and we needed we needed 20 to get the the initial game so that allowed us to do not just the first two decks because each deck is a character and so the, the you need two decks to play so two characters fight each other um 
So we didn't just get the first two decks, we got four decks, and we got also two expansion packs, one of which adds armored combat to the game, and the other one adds, um, well, Fiore is an Italian, and his system is sort of generally referred to as it, it, medieval Italian combat. But at the same period, there was stuff happening in Germany, and there is a very well-known amongst sword geeks, German medieval combat system. And so one of our decks plays that system, the German system, because our patron, I can get into that in a minute if you like, wanted that. And we also have the expansion pack so that any of the decks can add the techniques and terminology of this German longsword system to their existing game. So, yeah, we it, it ended up taking, <laughs> taking up much more of my life than I expected. Because again, you know, six decks is an awful lot more work than two. Yeah. But, and I mean, for people who want to do crowdfunding for either mm-hmm. uh, a game or uh, a book or um, a graphic novel, I think, again, is another sure. when you need artists, you need a lot more uh, money up front. Uh, any things that you've learned from crowdfunding, either the, the game or, or anything else that you're like, yeah, that's important for crowdfunding? There's there's a lot to be said about crowdfunding because it is its own separate thing. Plenty of people with massive, uh, you know, massive mailing lists and massive fame and what have you can completely screw up a crowdfunding campaign and it fails miserably, right? So being famous by itself is not enough because there's a sort of there's a culture to it, and so on the one hand you have to be completely transparent about what's going on so that people trust you. You have to absolutely deliver on all of your promises. You have to communicate like a maniac and you have to deliver obvious value because in the end they are buying something. Now, in some cases, what they're buying is the same sort of good feeling you get when you give a bunch of money to go save the elephants. But most cases they are actually buying a product. So they have to have some reason to believe that the product they're buying, they will actually get and it will actually be worth it. And so you have to communicate that uh, authority. I've actually, I've, I've written up a blog post about it. I can, I can mm. stick it in a. We'll in link to that in the show notes. Like. Because, sure. Yeah, I think a card game is a great example of something where you need the funding and, and investing right. in art. And, and that, as you say, it, there's a whole ecosystem for that. And um, all, all we can do today is really touch on all the things yeah. we're doing. <laughs> <laughs> sure. But I also wanted to ask you about audio because yeah. you have audio books. Some are sure. self-narrated. You have a podcast. Mm-hmm. And of course, swords again and fighting is, is visual and uh, there's no pictures in audio. <laughs> so how, I guess, how does audio play a part in your business? Okay. Well, the, again, it always boils, all boils down to does it serve the art or not? I knew I wanted an audio book for version of my theory and practice book because my book theory and practice of historical martial arts is mostly describing how things can be done rather than giving you specific exercises so it's not a how-to book it's more like a how to think about it book and so it actually works pretty well as an audiobook and again some people just learn better if they have it in audio they don't want video they don't want to sit and read it they want an audiobook and you know everybody learns differently this lets people who you know, prefer audiobooks to have at least those elements of the art that work in audio, in audio. And my podcast, The Sword Guy, it was a lockdown project. I got this idea in like, I don't know, May last year, I think. I One of the problems we're working on is that, or that I'm working on is historical martial arts generally was f- most of it was founded in the 90s and mostly by middle-class white blokes who are now middle-aged middle-class white blokes. <laughs> and, and so it naturally attracts middle-aged middle-class white blokes. And yet there are all sorts of other people, women, for example, who they can Shop solve. Horror. Of course they bloody women can. Like yes, doors. I mean, uh, right, right. And like like, like in, my, in my card game, one of those four character decks is a woman based on Lady Agnes Hotter, who I, I could go into the story, but I think we're running low on yeah. time. <laughs> All right, digression avoided, digression avoided. Okay, so so what I thought I would do is rather than just, you know, have a podcast where I just interview the usual suspects, 
I would, for a start, half of my guests are women, right? Slightly over half of my guests are women. That's deliberate. Mm. Because you know, women do do this. And my goal is by the time this has been running for well, it's nearly a year now, where we've had guests from Asia and South America and North America and Europe and Australia and all that. Obviously, some places are more represented than others, but there is somebody from pretty much everywhere. We have people of all races, all sexual identities, all backgrounds and whatever. And Pro- we do have... Probably not all of them, but... A, well, no, maybe a not all of them. A great variation. A great variation, yeah, yeah, okay. All is the goal, but we have a pretty good... My, basically, my goal is no matter who you are or where you're from, if you have an interest in swords, you can come to my podcast and you can find somebody like you being interviewed by me. Right. And so we do have a couple of token middle aged white guys there, too, because, you know, they're a demographic and it helps. It's uh, getting some of like, the really well known people in my field. And also you have, didn't you have Stephen Pressfield on as well? Uh, I, OK, I'm interviewing him uh, next week. Ah, there we go. Yeah, by the yeah, time yeah. this goes out, he might be on your show. I, by well. the time this goes out, I'll have Stephen Pressfield on. Yeah, absolutely. So that was, again, it's a tactic in the service of a larger goal. But it turned out to be really fun. So again, this was in the service of the art. There is no yeah. primary monetization from, no. except for the audio books, which obviously do make some money. <laughs> I wish they did. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no. So, so so far, the audio books have maybe well, this that audio book is actually still in the red. But again, because I have enough income coming in from different places, if a specific tactic doesn't necessarily make money. It doesn't matter if it serves the art, I can still afford to do it. And Um, I think with podcasting, like one of my big tips with podcasting, like, but my books and travel podcast is about uh, two years old now. And I didn't even consider monetization. I'm not considering it until year three to five, because I know how long it takes to build a voice brand. So I think you'll find that there will be opportunities in the future. And also it will help sell audio books. Absolutely. And, and I'm not expecting anything up really from it until it's passed, shall we say, episode 100. Yeah. That's like, I think, I think 100, 100 episodes is a good sort of base to work from. Yeah, it means you're taking give, it seriously, basically. Sure. But then how I started it, it was, okay, if I, I, I won't launch it until I have six episodes recorded, and then we'll see what that's like and how it goes. And I copied most of its DNA from your podcast because that's the one I listen to the most. Mm -hmm. So I I didn't even think really much about format and whatever. And it was all a bit slapdash in the beginning. But I had like, before I published the first episode, I had 10 in the bag because people will talk to you if you've got a podcast. It's amazing. Some people have said no, but most people don't, which is extraordinary. And it gives you a pretext for getting in touch with interesting people who you would like to talk to anyway. And saying, you know, would you like to talk to me um, for an hour or so about sorts and stuff? They might be a bit sort of perplexed. But if you say, I've got a podcast, would you like to talk to me for an hour or so about sorts and stuff for my podcast? They're like, oh, yeah, sure. That's a great idea. It is a magic formula. It's extraordinary. (laughs) It is, absolutely. And But also there's, okay, combining crowdfunding and audiobooks. By the time this goes out, the crowdfunding campaign will be long over. But not all of our historical sources are very picture heavy. And one of them, which is very important, called Paradoxes of Defense by George Silver, published in 1599, has like two images in the whole book, neither of which are critical for understanding anything. So I thought that would be a perfect candidate for another audiobook. And so I got a, an actor, a professional actor, to read it into the mic and narrate it and do the audio thing that way. And then I thought, well, hang on. In the 16th century, people did speak differently. And we do have historical researchers and historical linguists who are reconstructing how English was spoken in the time of Shakespeare. And 1599 is like peak Shakespeare. So I contacted the literally the top Shakespearean original pronunciation actor in the world, a guy called Ben Crystal, and asked him if he would do an original pronunciation read of Paradoxes of Defense. So I'm making these two audiobooks, one in modern pronunciation, one in original pronunciation. And of course, it's costing me a fortune because actors are expensive. But at least good actors (laughs) cost a lot of money. That's a better way to put it. And so I thought, you know what, 
I don't have a good in into the Shakespeare crowd or into the like Tudor theatre crowd or into the historical linguistics crowd, right? But so I, I need a way of of marketing this book that is deeply shareable, so it can make these kind of cross community connections. And I thought, well, crowdfunding is the obvious way to do it, and so that I'm crowdfunding because it. It allows it. Hopefully, it's launching next week. Hope it allows me to cross niches. So, because this project is of obvious interest to like Tudor theatre people, but I don't know any Tudor theatre people apart from well, now I know Ben Crystal because he's he's working for me. But uh, so, like again, it's another thing to think about crowdfunding. It's like, why are you crowdfunding it? What is crowdfunding going to give you? Because crowdfunding is time consuming, it's stressful, and it's expensive, right? I will lose about 15% of more than that, 18% of all the money I raise to Indiegogo's cut, PayPal's transfer fees. Also, Indiegogo have started holding back 5% of your fees to deal with refunds and stuff. And I think you get it eventually, but it's brutal, right? Mm-hmm. It's a horrible way to it's a horrible way to really sell your product unless the crowdfunding campaign itself is critically useful in some way. Mm. It's a good way to think about it. And I'm going to link to your article on crowdfunding in the show notes so people can find that. Uh, But we're out of time. Oh, my God. (laughs) I know. So where can people find you and everything you do online? Okay, I am in the process of rebuilding my swordschool.com best URL ever, (laughs) uh, swordschool.com website. And by the time this goes live, then that should be a really good place to go to find out all sorts of other things if you're into swords. But if you're less into swords and more into the stuff that we've talked about, I've put together a page on my website of resources for your people, which is at guywindsor.net forward slash Joanna. And it will have things like links to crowdfunding stuff. And and I'll take, for example, photographs of the insides. Most of your uh, listeners, I don't think particularly want to go and buy a rapier beginner's workbook because they don't want to <laughs> I think learn that's rapier. True. <laughs> <laughs> right, exactly. But they might be interested to see what it looks like on the inside. So I'll take photographs and stick that on this page so that you can go and see what the QR code looks like and the link and oh, all that thank sort of you thing. so much. That'd be very useful. So say that sure. URL again. It's guywindsor.net forward slash Joanna. Brilliant. Well, look, Guy, that has been... Oh, wait, tell people where they can find your sword your sword podcast too. Oh, at, at guywindsor.net, there's a link to the podcast, or you can just go guywindsor.net forward slash podcast. That will find it. Or open your podcast app right now. Yes, yes. The Sword the Guy. Sword. <laughs> <laughs> Even better, Joanna. Yes, thank you. <laughs> Brilliant. Well, thanks so much for your time, Guy. That was great. Thanks for having me, Joanna. It's been lovely to see you. So I hope you enjoyed the interview with Guy today and that it gave you some ideas for your own author business. I know I need to do my workbooks in ebook. That is definitely on my list, although my list is ever too long. (laughs) So coming up also this week, I have another in between episode. Many of you have asked for more discussion on NFTs as they continue to grow in the music and art industries. So I have an episode dedicated to NFTs coming up. It will be out this week and uh, hopefully you will find that useful. We, I get very excited with uh, John Fox. We have a discussion on all the different ways that authors and uh, the publishing industry can potentially use NFTs and a very exciting time. And if you don't know what they are at all, definitely listen in. And if you do know something about them, I think we'll also give you some ideas. So it should be suitable for everyone interested in what is not actually even a futurist topic anymore. It is a almost here topic. Um, the first NFTs for publishing is going to launch in the fall, in autumn, probably at Frankfurt Book Fair. And I mean, we can already doing these things. And there are writers who are already putting books up through the various NFT places. So this is not futurist. This is now. It's just, I guess, the leading edge of things. 
Then next Monday on The Usual Show, I'm talking to Jessica Bell about her journey as a multi-passionate creative to running a small press and how writing song lyrics, making music, fiction, memoir and non-fiction all play a part in her author life, as well as the challenges of running a small press. So uh, yeah, if you ever get annoyed by the people who say, oh, you should just do the one thing or you should focus and only write in one genre, blah, 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 then uh, you will hear our discussion on being a multi-passionate creative and I'm a multi-passionate not as multi-passionate as Jessica (laughs) she really has this whole music side as well so that is coming up next week happy writing and I'll see you next time thanks for listening today I hope you found it helpful you might also like the backlist episodes and show notes available at thecreativepen.com forward slash podcast you can also get your free author blueprint at thecreativepen.com forward slash blueprint. If you'd like to connect, you can tweet me at The Creative Pen or find me on Facebook at The Creative Pen. See you next time.